Nobody got you the way I do. Whatever demons you're fighting through. <laughs> YouTube, welcome back to the channel. Now, with the Kaiju number eight anime right around the corner, I know that there is going to be a lot of questions about this series. So, with as little spoilers as possible, let's talk about the basics of Kaiju number eight. Now, for starters, Kaiju literally translates to strange beast or monster. So, strange beast number eight or monster number eight. And some examples of Kaiju that you've probably heard of in the past are world famous Godzilla. King Kong, Mothra, etc. Kaiju number eight takes place in Japan, which happens to have the highest kaiju emergence rate in the world. These kaiju emerge from water, land, sky, and attack civilization. And this is where the Japan Defense Force enters. The Japan Defense Force is basically a military organization that neutralizes kaiju. And once these kaiju have been neutralized, there is a special crew of heroes that arrives at the scene. And most probably wouldn't call them heroes. Most people in Japan would probably call them the kaiju cleaners or AKA the janitors who clean up the kaiju remains and also help get resources from those remains too. Our story follows Kafka Hibano. Kafka is 32 years old, which is very atypical for a shonen main character and part of the thing that drew me into the series to begin with. You never see a main character 30 plus years old in a shonen series. That is some seinen type business. And Kafka is a chronic drinker and smoker. He also takes a very apathetic approach towards life. On the outside, he's always smiling and happy with those around him. But on the inside, he just questions himself. He questions, how did I even end up living a life like this? And that's because Kafka currently works as what we just talked about, a kaiju janitor. But his childhood dream and promise that he made to his boo, Mina Ashiro, is for him to join the Defense Force. Him and Mina were supposed to join the Defense Force and neutralize Kaiju together. See, Mina and Kafka lost everything to a Kaiju attack as children. And whenever they lost everything, Mina lost her Miko the Cat and Kafka lost his Gurdaman video game. They both vowed to each other that they were going to join the Defense Force and neutralize Kaiju side by side together. Now, all these years later, and Mina is one of the strongest members in the Defense Force, while Kafka never even passed the test to be able to join the Defense Force. And now it's too late for Kafka to even join because there is a 30-year-old age limit to be able to join the Defense Force. And you see that feeling of failure and regret any time that he sees Mina or just thinks about what his future should have been versus what it is now. And part of what makes Kaiju number eight so compelling is how real these relationships feel. We've all had feelings of failure or regret after letting the ones that we love or even worse, letting yourself down. And we can continue to feel bad for ourselves or we can take agency of our situations and make changes. And I think that's what this series is really about. Taking agency of your situation and not giving up on your dreams keep on chasing those aspirations. And this is also where our next main cast character, Reno Ichikawa, comes into play. Reno is an 18 year old kid with white hair and we all know that any character with white hair in an anime is one of the coldest characters in that series. And Reno is literally the coldest character in this series. You'll see why later. But Reno ends up joining the Kaiju janitors alongside Kafka. He truly views this janitor job more so as a stepping stone for his real goal of getting to the Defense Force. And upon meeting Kafka when he joins the janitors, he learns that Kafka wanted to join the Defense Force at one point too, but gave up on that dream. And Reno gets mad about it and starts roasting Kafka for giving up on that dream of joining the Defense Force. He doesn't get why you would ever give up on something like that. But shortly afterwards, Kafka ends up taking Reno under his wing and teaches him all the ropes of being a kaiju janitor. And in return, Reno tells Kafka that he should keep on chasing that dream of joining the Defense Force because just recently, the age limit has been raised to 33 years old due to a declining birth rate in Japan. So to make a long story short, Reno basically talks Kafka into joining the Defense Force and they both end up agreeing to try to join together. But in the meantime, Kafka ends up accidentally eating a kaiju and becoming a kaiju himself. 
So you can see the nuance of Kafka becoming a kaiju and also wanting to join the defense force that exterminates kaiju, right? But still, nonetheless, Reno pushes Kafka to chase this last opportunity of joining the defense force and making his dreams come true and fulfilling his promise to his childhood boo, Mina Ashura. They both end up applying and joining the defense force together and they both get accepted into the third division of the defense force, which is stacked with a bunch of rookies in their first year. And this is where we also meet a lot of our main supporting cast within Kaiju number eight. One of the first people that you'll meet in the third division is our captain, AKA Ka or Kafka's boot, Mina Ashura. Our vice captain is my favorite character in the series, Soshiro Hoshina. Hoshina is a master of close quarters combat and he typically fights with two blades and uses a mixture of speed and power to his advantage you'll see one of the most talented rookies in all of Japan that goes by the name of Kikoro Shinomiya. Kikoro is a small girl with a huge personality and loves to use even bigger weapons. And as this anime goes on, there is not a doubt in my mind that Kikoro will quickly become a lot of people's favorite character just because she's flat out badass. And then the last two supporting main characters that you'll see are Ihoru Furuhashi, which is basically our version of Bakugo. <laughs> and then finally, Aoi Kagaragi. And yeah, Kagaragi is swole as hell and he wins arm wrestling fights against Kafka. Dang, and then how did I almost forget our third division scientist, the sweetheart lady Okanogi. And if you don't like Okanogi, I don't like you. It's pretty simple. Whoa, just take it easy, man. Now, let's switch gears and talk about kaiju instead of talking about humans. We do have a classification system for kaiju. Anytime that these kaiju invade civilization, the defense force can figure out their strength by using something called a fortitude system. My assumption is that the fortitude scale goes from 0 to 10, but we have never actually been told explicitly how far the scale goes but based on where a kaiju falls on the fortitude scale will dictate which one of three classifications that a kaiju can fit into. A dai kaiju or a big beast is any kaiju that has a fortitude of over 8.0. These are the strongest kaiju that will emerge and anytime that a dai kaiju emerges, the defense force gives an assigned number to that kaiju. So Kaiju number eight got its name because it is a Dai Kaiju and it is the eighth Dai Kaiju that emerged in Japan. Thus, Kaiju number eight, right? The next classification of Kaiju that you can have is called a Hanju or a main beast. This is any Kaiju that has a fortitude of over a 6.0. These, for these Kaiju are typically strong and will attack by themselves even if they aren't with a Dai Kaiju. And then finally, the smallest and weakest class of kaiju is called a yoju, or a residual beast. And yoju usually attack alongside a hanju or a daikaiju, not typically attacking by themselves. Now, whenever daikaiju lead huge attacks and have hanju and yoju alongside of them, that is called a calamity because they are bringing about just a huge attack alongside of them that is bringing calamity to the civilization, right? And then finally, there is a type of kaiju that is classified based on its size and not its strength. This class of kaiju is called a super giant kaiju and the name literally speaks for itself. These are some of the hardest kaiju to stop just because of their sheer size. They are always city level threats and tower over some of the biggest buildings that might be in whatever city they emerge in. We have to have special weapons to take out some of these super huge kaiju before they cause mass amounts of destruction from just how big they are. So yeah, I think that's pretty much all the basics of kaiju number eight. The beauty of kaiju number eight is that this is a shonen series that is so simple in an era where people want series that have such deep lore, right? Such deep meaning. But this story uses a lot of emotions and situations that you would face in real life and shows you why you have to continue to push through them, why you have to continually chase your dreams. No matter what you might feel, it's what you need to do. And more than anything, you're gonna see some really cool kaiju designs, some of the best weapon designs that you will see in any anime. And then, honestly, you're just gonna see some badass men and women protecting what they love most 
against monsters coming to attack civilization. Tell me you don't want to tune in for that. It just sounds badass to watch. This series might not be as deep as Berserk or Attack on Titan, but when these high emotional moments hit, you are going to feel like you can run through a brick wall. And I'm excited to run through that wall with you. So if you tune into this video, arigato. And go listen to the One Republic song that they just dropped for us, bro. That nobody, it just makes you want to dance when it comes on. Like, hey. Nobody got you the way I do. Whatever demons you're fighting through. Nobody. <laughs>